You're listening to KRUULP 100.1 FM, the voice of Fairfield, Iowa, and beyond, the Midwest only solar powered radio station. My name is Dennis Mundy. My show is Speaking Freely, and my guest today uh, here in Gothenburg, Sweden, is Stephen Maloney. Uh, Stephen is uh, an expert in the area of coffee. He is the Swedish national barista champ uh, these last two years, 2016 and 2017. He'll be representing uh, Sweden in the World Barista Competition. And for those that don't know it, the barista is the guy when you come into a, a cafe that uh, draws and uh, serves the coffee. It's quite uh, complicated what's involved. And uh, he, will, uh, he is also the founder and director of the Barista League, and we'll, which we'll be talking about uh, today. And uh, for my listeners who aren't aware of this yet, <laughs> I'm a coffee freak. I, I love coffee. I don't know a whole lot. I'm learning from people like Stephen and others I've talked to. And this will uh, most likely be part of a series I'm doing, and uh, perhaps a blog and uh, uh, a whole uh, uh, blog on and a podcast on coffee. So uh, this is the beginning of that. And Stephen, I, I thank you so very much for taking the time to come on uh, my show today. Thanks for having me. So uh, let's start at the beginning. You, you, you moved, I think, in 2012 from Australia to uh, Gothenburg, Sweden. I, and I should say, I'm visiting my wife's family in Gothenburg, which is a beautiful city, it's the second largest city in Sweden on the west coast of Sweden. And uh, while here, I, I visited a number of cafes uh, in Scandinavia. And I want to also mention that Steve is the barista trainer at, at uh, Damateo, which is a fabulous, fabulous uh, uh, cafe and uh, roaster of coffee uh, here in Gothenburg. And so when, when did you get the coffee bug? Was it in Australia or was it when you came to, uh, to Sweden? Uh, it was mostly when I came to Sweden, actually. I mean, I remember drinking coffee kind of through high school and through university, but uh, I don't think there was much thought about quality. Um, but when I, when I moved here and kind of got sucked into the coffee mm -hmm. scene, there's just so much, like so many amazing people and so much amazing coffee that it was hard to kind of get, get out of. So. Well, well, when yeah. did you uh, uh, did you just happen to go to a cafe? And I should say that the coffee culture in Scandinavia is quite advanced. I would compare it to like the northwest of the United States. Uh, these cafes, uh, many of them, uh, have uh, super good baristas and uh, very uh, concerned about which beans they use and so on and so forth. Uh, what was the first place you remember going where you thought, "Boy, there's a lot to this." Well, um, actually, I kind of came to Sweden and like most people didn't have a job and couldn't kind of do what I used to do back in Australia. So I just got a job at kind of a tiny little cafe. We served pretty average, pretty bad coffee. But I was lucky enough to be trained by the then Swedish Brista champion, mm -hmm. just kind of happenstance. Uh, we kind of hit it off and I just kept hassling him like, teach me more, teach me more. Uh, you know, let, tell me everything that you know. And uh, it kind of all happened from there. So wow. through him and the company he used to work for and then the company he used to own, I uh, kind of started moving, moving through like that. Right. Yeah. And let, let me, uh, again, for our listeners that are <clears throat> not so familiar with coffee, uh, it all begins, as I understand, by uh, uh, the picking of the cherries or, or coffee beans, uh, often in Kenya and in, in Colombia in uh, countries like that, South and Central, uh, uh, South Central America, Africa. There are certain places that grow great, great coffee. And then uh, once those coffee beans are selected, and that has to be a whole art and science onto itself, they are then roasted. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, you have the, the work at origin, um, picking, farming, sorting, processing the coffee. And then there's a whole kind of industry around getting it to the country where it's going to be roasted. This whole system of importers and exporters and logistics. Uh, and then once you get it here to Sweden, then you, you have to roast it. So that's kind of where we start to look at the coffees, buying the right ones, and spending a lot of time working out how to roast it to okay. get the best results. So before the roasting, buying the coffee, <clears throat> what are you looking for? Um, it really depends. I mean, people buy coffee for different reasons. So uh, we tend to buy really light, elegant, uh, like fruit-driven coffees, ones that show off the, the terroir and origin that we're buying from. So for example, when we're buying a Kenyan coffee, we're looking for this really like nice high acidity, a lot of sweetness, kind of um, black currants, rhubarb, rhubarb notes. 
But whereas when we go to a Brazilian coffee for espresso, we might look for a slightly more kind of nutty, really smooth and sweet, kind of a different taste profile. Okay, but, so you hear often uh, them talk about uh, dark and light roast. So a light roast is more acidic and it's more what you're looking for. A darker roast would be something that would go more for espresso. Am, am I getting that right? Uh, kind of. I mean, it's it's a, a lot about a matter of preference. Mm -hmm. uh, we tend to roast quite light. And the reason for that is it doesn't obscure any of the, the natural origin or terroir of the coffee. So basically, if you think about roast, like uh, toasting bread, kind of you have two different types of bread, like a really light, white, sweet bread, and then a kind of dark rye bread. Okay. They start off very differently. But if you just toast them until they're blacker and blacker and blacker, they start to taste more the same. So it's kind of similar with coffee. You can have these two very different coffees and the darker you roast them, the more they just taste of the roast kind of mm -hmm. effect. That, that's, so, the best, um, that's the best analogy I've heard. Now I think I understand it finally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, okay. of course, in the middle there, you, there's a lot of room for different grades of roast and different styles of roast. But I mean, in essence, we try to keep it uh, as light as possible so you don't taste any of the actual roast effect on the coffee and you just taste the transparency of of the um, raw ingredient. Okay, so um, take us then, so you, you buy the beans, and, and all, all, also what I'm hearing a lot about these days, and I, I first heard this when I was in uh, Portland, Oregon, but I'm here, I hear it everywhere now, especially in, since I've been in Scandinavia, and that is that uh, single origin, that in the past, uh, beans used to come from many different places, maybe to make the, the same coffee, but now they talk about it the coffee coming from one place. Uh, talk to us about single origin. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that it's not, it's, there's nothing inherently better about a coffee being from a single place or being part of a blend, but I think it was all part of a, a movement to kind of educate customers that this comes from somewhere. This is not just coffee, it, it comes from a, a farm in Colombia or it comes from a, a small region in Ethiopia. So when you say a single origin, you can show off the specific taste characteristics of that particular bean or varietal or that area or even that farm. So mm -hmm. you can have kind of these incredible microclimates in different places that taste really unique and special. Mm -hmm. And having a single origin is just a way to show off that particular flavor and, and or that the, particular potential of that coffee. And then often when you go in a cafe, you'll, you'll see fair trade. Uh, and I assume that has to do with how the farmer who grows the coffee is dealt with. Is that right? <laughs> Yeah, it is. I mean, the fair trade and organic and all the certifications is, is really tricky. And it's, I think it's something that a lot of people in specialty coffee, which is kind of what we're working with, third wave coffee, I think it's called in the States as mm -hmm. well, um, struggle with communicating and, and dealing with because uh, fair trade and these uh, certifications, they work super well for big companies. So someone like McDonald's who buys in bulk and uh, they don't have time to visit every farm because they're buying so much of it they can go through a certification scheme and make sure that the stuff they're buying is, is beneficial to the, to the people there on the farms. Whereas we typically buy in really tiny volumes. We have really good relationships with a lot of the places that we're buying from. So we can go there to the, to the, to the farm or to the um, cooperative and, and visit them and talk to them. In which case with the quantities we're working with, sometimes it's not valuable for them or for us to be certified, but we still um, try to, educate people that we are paying a lot more than the fair trade price or than the commercial price and we're looking after their interests as well as as uh, the interests of the people around them right for those just tuning in you're listening to kruulp 100.1 fm my name is dennis raimundi my guest today stephen maloney founder and director of uh, the barista league and also the barista national champion in uh, sweden 2016, 2017, we'll be representing Sweden, Sweden in the world uh, barista competition. Uh, <clears throat> Stephen, okay, so the beans come in. Then the next step uh, that I think uh, a lot of people uh, are, you know, not, don't even realize this is a big part of making coffee is the roasting of the beans. Uh, how, do, how, uh, uh, how does that take place? Tell us about that. And are, are there a variety of ways to do it? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, of course, like, like anything. So um, I'm... I'm in really close contact with our roasters, but I don't actually roast myself. So uh, if there's any coffee roasters out there, they're going to have to forgive me for my, my ignorance. Uh -huh. But um, no, I mean, basically, like a lot of a lot of the roasting actually comes down to tasting and being able to affect changes in taste using the equipment. So it's less about the actual standing in a machine and kind of, uh, you know, adjusting the gas. And it's more about making making a decision, like tasting the coffee 
deciding you want it to be sweeter or mm -hmm. maybe lighter or this or that, and then being able to think, okay, well, if I do this to the roasting curve, if we maybe push it, um, start the roast at a little bit higher temperature, then that might affect it in this certain way. So the problem with roasting, I understand, is that every roast is different depending on the altitude, the temperature, the build of the roaster, where the temperature probe is. So it's really hard to generalize. And um, my experience is that it's a lot of it comes down to just the experience of the people roasting and how they can mm -hmm. taste and affect those those uh, changes. Right. And, uh, you mentioned before <clears throat> in the United States, we're what's called uh, in third wave coffee. And uh, as I understand that, the first wave was you know, people just drinking anything like Maxwell House. And then along came Starbucks and people started thinking, OK, you can have specialty coffee and specialty drinks and all that. And then along came in the States anyway, I think it was Stumptown in, in Portland, Oregon. Uh, and they started saying, well, the origin of the bean is important, how it's roasted. And so it went to another level. So in regard to roasting, uh, I've heard it said that uh, bigger companies that uh, like Starbucks that are massive, they tend to uh, over roast because and so everything starts tasting like the the piece of bread you mentioned that's toasted for a long time like the roast uh whereas if uh the if it's not over roasted you get more of the taste of the bean am i am i on to something there is that accurate yeah absolutely and i think it comes down to consistency like it's it's very easy to make a coffee consistently taste roasty or taste like that kind of a little bit charcoaly kind of roasted flavor because you just roast it to a certain degree and everything tastes the same. So you can be very consistent, but perhaps that's not consistently delicious. It's just consistent. Uh, so then we try to focus on just really trying to taste every batch and we roast in much smaller quantities and make sure our quality control is really strict so that everything that goes out is, uh, is up to the standards that we're looking for. Right. And I think the way you taste coffee, it's called, the expression is cupping. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, uh, yeah, to explain that. So I think most people probably to the other type of, of coffee. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, this is the way we taste coffee. So like a wine, wine sampling where mm -hmm. you go along and kind of sip out of a glass and spit. We have a similar thing, but um, you grind the coffee, you put it in a, in a cup, in a bowl, uh, you fill it with water. And then after four minutes, you can skim away the coffee off the top and start to slurp it out of a spoon. And uh, the reason we do this is basically to isolate the coffee from all the brewing variables. So by doing it the same way every time, the same temperature water, the same ratio, the same process, then it means that we're not tasting different brewing variables. We're just tasting the, the coffee that's in the cup. Okay. So you can start to build this kind of memory bank of, oh, well, I tasted this coffee last year, last harvest, and I tasted it this year, and we brewed it the same. Uh, so what the differences we're tasting is just in the actual crop or in the roast. Well, and um, uh, so then you have it uh, roasted. And then your job, the barista, uh, how much influence and effect does the barista have on the quality of coffee that's served? Um, quite a bit, actually. I mean, I think this is like a lot of people like to draw parallels to wine. But the, the great mm. thing about wine is that once it's in a bottle, that's the end product. So you, it's consistent once you bottled it up, pretty much. Whereas coffee, like uh, the final delivery of it, makes such a big impact on how it's going to taste. So a barista's job is really to understand like how to extract the coffee, like how to dissolve the, the coffee flavors out of the coffee bean into the cup and to make that taste as, as good as they can. So, I mean, there's lots of, lots of different variables from how hot water to how fine you grind the coffee to how long the contact, the water's in contact with the coffee to all sorts of things. So there's really quite a bit of knowledge that good baristas build up and able to be able to serve a really great cup of coffee. Yeah, no, I, I when I go into a, a cafe, I, I can often tell if the barista is just somebody they trained in an hour and they just, this is what you do. And whereas if it's somebody who's really um, uh, has a passion for it and is careful about every step. And one, one of the things I've noticed, if somebody's not so experienced or not so skilled at it, uh, like if you get a cappuccino, it'll be so hot, it, you know, it'll burn your lips. Whereas I believe some of those beverages, especially uh, uh, milk edited coffee beverages, are not supposed to be served hot like that. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, when when you foam the milk way too hot, it just starts to kind of it tastes uh, really really bitter and and takes away all the sweetness of the drink. So being able to kind of 
uh, whether it's, yeah, just rote practice, making sure that you can really foam the milk really well, or it's more of a knowledge and understanding thing about why is it that, that the milk affects the drink in that way. Mm-hmm. Um, there's really a lot of stuff to, to work on mm-hmm. if, yeah. if you're interested in, in, in going down that path. Right, right. And Stephen, and uh, I also wanted to ask, uh, you're going, you won the uh, Swedish National Breeder Championships two years in a row, and you're going into the world competition. What do they look for in those competitions? What what are they evaluating you on? Yeah, I mean, they started kind of back in the time that you were talking about where people were first introducing the world to specialty coffee. So it was all about defining, like, what is it that a barista should be able to do? Well, they should be able to work clean. They should be able to describe the coffee, um, present really amazing tasting drinks. And over the past 10 or 15 years, they've developed into this really kind of special competition. But basically, the one I compete in, it, you serve four espressos, four cappuccinos, and then four signature drinks, which is basically like a, a cocktail without alcohol. Mm-hmm. And you have to promote the flavors and characteristics of the coffee that you're serving, that you've brought with you, and describe it really well. So you get a lot of points if you say this coffee is going to taste smooth and sweet and of cherries and dark chocolate. And then it, when the judges find those taste notes, you do really well. Um, that does it, what's your signature drink? Oh, it's a, a bit of a secret, but it's uh, I'm calling it Ethiopian champagne. And it's a really light and fresh kind of sparkling coffee drink. Fab- fabulous. All right, so you, you are, uh, one thing I want to get into today is uh, the Barista League. You are the founder uh, of the Barista League and uh, directing it, it, and it's found at thebaristaleague.com. Uh, yeah, people should check that out. Uh, tell us about how that came about and what you want to accomplish. What's your mission? Right. I mean, uh, it's basically like an event for coffee professionals. So there are um, uh, there's a lot of a lot of people who get to fly around the world and visit farms and go to kind of fairs and stuff and do all this really cool stuff, like all the things we're talking about. But then there's a whole segment of of coffee professionals that just like plug away, work behind the cafes, do all this, are really interested and do all the hard work, but don't often get a chance to kind of participate in the fun side of coffee. So um, what I wanted to do was create a, an event that was really easy for people to engage in, that could kind of accommodate anyone from a new beginner all the way to a you know, superstar world champion. They could all come together, learn from each other and have fun. So um, it's basically a one night event. You compete in teams of two across three kind of varying rounds of coffee skills that change at each event. And we have some drinks and we have some fun and it's just uh, like a really good event for people to, to kind of meet each other and hang out. All right, and, and, and you're going to be going, I think, in 2018. Uh, we're recording this in uh, September of uh, 2017 now. But some, sometime in 2018, I believe you're going to be coming and introducing this in the States. Is that right? That is. So it's, it's all a bit hush-hush at the moment. But um, we have plans to head over to the States in late summer 2018, take take a few different cities across, across a few weeks. And uh, I'm really excited about it, actually. I have some partners over in the States, and they seem to tell me that it's going to be quite big and quite exciting. Well, I, I think it's amazing. I, I've noticed this in the last few years. And like I, my daughter was living in Portland, Oregon, and I went out there and then I realized how serious people can be about coffee and the, the different levels of quality and all that. And I think that has spread throughout uh, the U.S. and certainly in Europe, it's been like that uh, uh, longer. But even we I met somebody from Vietnam and I met somebody from Tehran and from Japan. Coffee is big, big everywhere, and, and it's, a, it, it's evolving. Uh, uh, and, and now they, they use the term coffee culture. Uh, tell, tell us a little bit, what, what does that mean to you when you hear the expression coffee culture? Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess it means a lot of different things, which is why coffee is so interesting. Because you can have a, a coffee culture that has nothing to do with the taste of the coffee, and it has everything to do with the way that you and your family grew up drinking coffee. Right, right. And that's super important. Uh, and then you can have maybe coffee culture defining kind of oh, my nerdy coffee competitions and, and that kind of thing. So I guess that's why I like coffee is that it's so broad and it's so deep. So you can really get into, you know, coffee logistics, how people ship coffee around the world. Or you can really get into just grinder uh, manufacturing and particle size distribution. Or you can get into more the, the cultural aspects. So mm-hmm. there's so much to dig into, which is why I think I'm still... Super excited about coffee. Right, right. Now, for those just tuning in, you're listening to KRUULP 100.1 FM. My name is Dennis Mundy. Uh, my show is speaking to me. My guest today is Stephen Maloney, founder of the Barista League and two-time 
a national barista champion in uh, Sweden, 2017-2018, will be going in a national competition, and uh, uh, international competition, I should say, world championship. Uh, so explain also to me, like, um, if I get, uh, uh, just comparing like Sweden to Italy, if I go to Italy, uh, everything is done similarly uh, over the years that I've been in, going to Italy, where they'll have, you know, you can get a, uh, an, uh, a, a cappuccino or espresso in the morning, but then in the afternoon or evening, you only get espresso. Uh, they, I think they're darker roasts down there, uh, whereas in uh, Sweden, I'll find the whole range. Uh, how, how would you compare those two? Um, yeah, I mean, firstly, I have to say that there are some amazing specialty shops um, around Italy, if you, if you know where to look for them. Mm -hmm. But I mean, traditionally, I mean, since they started with the espresso back in the 50s, I think it's quite a traditional way of like um, producing and, and brewing the coffees, whereas, uh, which is that espresso and a little bit darker roast and kind of quick, fast and very personal service. Um, here in Sweden, there's this like very deep tradition of, of filter coffee. So people drink a lot of coffee, they drink it at home, they drink it at work. And um, I guess the quality even for commercial coffee is quite good here in Sweden. Mm -hmm. So maybe 10, 15 years ago, they kind of started this Nordic Nordic style of roasting, which is this emphasis on light roasts and, and being able to demonstrate or show off the acidity and fruit fruitiness of these coffees and the, the natural terroir. Um, so, I mean, you have some of, the, some of the best filter coffees that I've ever tasted coming out of you know, different roasters in Copenhagen, Oslo, Gothenburg, Stockholm, these people with just like years of knowledge doing this amazing level of roasting for filtered and, coffee. And a f filtered coffee, well, give us an example of what you mean by filtered coffee. I mean, anything produced to, the, to that lower strength without uh, pressure. So like a coffee machine, for example, um, a V60 where you kind of pour water, like right. a pour over, where you pour water over the coffee bed or an Aeropress, French press, like a, mm -hmm. yeah. You no, can, and it, let, let's... Uh, and this will be a subject for another interview, but some of these other ways of making coffee, like a, a Chemex would be a pour over. I use that. But also the AeroPress, isn't that used with pressure? Isn't that more like making espresso or is that somewhere in between? Would that be considered a filtered coffee? Uh, yeah, it's a bit of uh, confusion about it, but it's it's nowhere near enough pressure to be considered a, an espresso. Right. So you, you maybe produce a tiny bit of pressure, but I would mm -hmm. still consider it definitely a brew, a brew coffee. Mm -hmm. Right. Something like a mocha pot, like the Bialetti, the right. Italian stovetop uh, thing, that's somewhere in between because it generates a little bit of pressure, not enough to be called espresso, but uh, somewhere in the strength range between espresso and filter coffee. Right. Hey, Stephen, we have about five minutes left, but one thing I want uh, uh, our listeners to hear about is they have this wonderful uh, thing in Sweden called Fika, F-I-K-A. Explain that to our listeners. <laughs> Oh, the Fika question. Um, I feel, uh, <laughs> I feel like, like I'm not worthy to be able to speak about being Australian. But I mean, basically, it's, it's about getting together with, with someone and uh, having some coffee and maybe some cakes in the afternoon, typically. So it can, it, it can be anything from a long three or four hour conversation with coffee and, and food and cakes all the way to just a quick catch up um, or even a Fika by yourself where you right. just sit and study or read a book. And it's right. just this kind of deeply ingrained culture of having some time in a place to sit down, have some coffee and uh, catch up with someone or with yourself. Yeah, it's, it's wonderful. And I, I have to say, I've been coming to Sweden for a number of years. My wife is from here. Uh, and uh, this thing of Vika, to me, it means uh, going and get a coffee and a bun. And, and, right, Sweden, yeah. and we have great ones in Sweden. And it's not like getting your coffee and a cup to go. This is sitting down, having it, taking your time, either by yourself or you're often chatting with another person and you're going to be there for a half hour, hour, two hours, whatever. And they take, it can be a noun or a verb, Fika. Uh, so yeah, exactly. Anyway. Uh, all right, uh, Stephen, we have just a couple of minutes left here. Where do you see uh, coffee going in the next few years? What would you like to be doing in coffee eventually? Uh, tough question. I mean, um, I mean, I hope that more in the, in the broader scheme, more people realize that coffee is not just coffee, that it can be, uh, different things. So uh, different coffees from different regions can taste completely different and you can have different preferences across the year or across the day. Um, so that would be nice. And then I guess um, for me, I just, I, I mean, I, I like, just want to be doing what I'm doing, meeting people, getting to make and taste amazing coffee and, and just uh, chat to people about coffee. It's fun. Yeah, I, I think you told me, uh, Stephen, once off air, 
we were chatting, and you said that the, the difference between a roaster and a barista is a roaster is it's more of a lonely people uh, very focused on what they're doing, whereas being a barista, a big part of it is not just making the coffee, which is huge, but also into your interaction with the people and giving them a good experience, and there's a lot of personality involved. Would you agree? <laughs> Yeah, my roasters are going to hate me for that. <laughs> no, um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a very a very disciplined thing to be a roaster. You have to be really focused oh. and, and make sure you're consistent. Whereas uh, being a barista, a lot of it is that contact with your customers. So whether it's when I do the Bristol League and I get to meet other baristas from around the world or just in the bar getting to chat with uh, customers and actually interact and do something different every day, I think it's a really kind of key part of the service kind of industry. Wonderful. Well, this is a very educational Again, for those uh, just tuning in, you're listening to KRUULP 100.1 FM. My name is Dennis Money. My show speaking freely. My guest today has been Stephen Malloy, who is the national barista champion for the, the country of Sweden, 2016-2017. We'll go in world competition. should also say when I did my research, uh, Scandinavia consumes more coffee per capita than any country in the world and is a lot consumed uh, in many countries in Europe. Uh, and this whole third wave, as we say in the United States of coffee, this whole specialty coffee and whatnot, believe me, it's, it's everywhere in Eastern Europe, in, in Asia, uh, South America, everywhere. So, and uh, one of the things I'd like to do with uh, uh, my blog slash podcast that I might be developing in this area uh, is uh, to give some people some guidelines. What are some great places to go to? Uh, like, for instance, if you're in Gothenburg, there's a number of places, but Da Mateo, where Stephen is, uh, you, every time you go there, you are going to get an excellent cup of coffee, whether it's an espresso or a cappuccino or a latte or whatever it is you ask for. It's going to be absolutely uh, exquisitely good. Uh, some things might uh, be more to your taste than other things, but uh, that, that's, and that's what I look for when I evaluate a cafe is uh, the quality and also consistency that it's not just dependent upon one or two baristas, but that every barista there. And Stephen, you train the baristas, so uh, uh, that's probably why there's that great consistency, right? Yeah, I can't take all the credit for it. I mean, uh, we have some amazing people that we work with, so yeah, uh, and some great coffee. So yeah, and I, I think the first thing I would uh, evaluate if I was hiring a barista was if they really love this whole thing, they get it, and they're really into it. It's just like wine or anything else. There's a real passion for it. So. Uh, uh, again, my, my website, uh, Dennis.tv, not .com, but .tv. I have about 500 shows archived there. Uh, my other podcast, SpiritMattersTalk.com, which I do with my co-host, Phil Goldberg, out in Los Angeles. And uh, broadcasting today, from uh, recording today, from Gothenburg, Sweden. And uh, more about coffee coming up uh, in the near future, so uh, stay tuned. You're listening to KRUULP 100.1 FM. Stephen, thank you so much. Thanks, Evan.